Hello everyone, uh, my name is Brian Shirley and today I'm going to be talking about the kind of do's and kind of don'ts of phosphatic microfossil preparation and microanalysis. This is based on a paper that we recently published um, in Micron. Uh, it's by myself, one of our collaborators, Mikkel Bessman, and my PhD supervisor, Amelia Yarohovska. This is the product of about three years of work um as part of my phd and today we're basically going to talk through what three years of preparation looks like so um just to show you what we've applied this workflow to we have worked with cephalopods we've worked with bivalves and brachiopods we've worked with some crustaceans uh we've even played around a little bit a little bit with spinosaur teeth and some jawless vertebrate scales and also pterosaur teeth, sediments, and also some metals. But the main focus of my work and what we'll be looking at as kind of a proxy for these methods are actually conodonts. So conodonts are a group of marine vertebrates that range from the Cambrian up into the Triassic. They're mainly known from tooth-like elements, so they're referred to as elements, but they function as teeth that are generally extracted from bulk rock relatively easily, and they're found very abundantly. They range between one and two millimeters long in most cases, but they can be a few millimeters longer or even a lot smaller. Another issue with conodonts is a lack of soft body remains. There are some soft body remains that are known, but in general, for a lot of taxa, we don't actually have any soft body remains. This has led to a lot of speculation and a lot of inferring just simply from their teeth, which is potentially why there's a lot of very strange artist renditions of what the animal itself might have looked like. However, I'm not quite so photogenic myself, so maybe this is why I relate to this fossil so much. So I tried to come up with an analogy for what sample preparation is like. And I feel like it's sitting at one side of the room trying to throw a piece of paper into a bin. If you go and you get it in the first time, this is what is going to be picked up by social media. This is what is going to be picked up in science. It's going to be uh, seen as amazing and revolutionary. But that's not quite what I am interested in. I'm more interested in the paper balls that are complete messes. The ones that completely miss the mark, the ones that get a little bit closer, and the ones that are spectacular fails. Because in your preparation process, the ones that fail are the ones that give us the most information on how we can improve in the future. So if you look at some of these fails I've done in the past, we can have catastrophic, catastrophic failure. We can have whatever this hot mess is. We can have issues with chemical etching, and then we can have things that get so close, but because of gaps just aren't adequate. And when you do actually get a shot into the trash can, you're going to end up with something like this. Now, it's not perfect, but this is a conodont that we've created a section through, and you can very clearly see all the individual growth stages of it. And if we zoom in, we can see structures that are up to 200 nanometers across, which for this kind of study, if you want to do a chemical analysis, you want to do sclerochronology, you want to look at growth rates, this is the kind of resolution that you need to work with microfossils. So the aim of our paper was to create a workflow that people could adapt to their own samples and their own questions or hypothesis. This is an example of the workflow on the left. And this is what I'm going to more or less talk about for the rest of my talk. So there's a couple of pre-preparation considerations that you need to make. And the main one is, do you want to make a resin block or a thin section? We generally recommend resin blocks because they allow the same SEM based analysis to be done, but they provide more stability to microfossils and easier handling and orientation. However, thin sections are the only way if you want to do transmitted light microscopy. So once you have decided whether you want to have a resin block or a thin section, it now comes down to your selection of resin. 
And not all resins are the same. And there was three main criteria that we wanted to select for our resin. Uh, we needed a resin that was suitable for low pressure environments, like in an SEM, because some resins can actually give off residual gases, um, which can contaminate the internals of your SEM. Uh, we wanted something with low viscosity because with low viscosity, we could avoid these gaps between our fossil sample, which can lead to contamination later on down the road. And also we wanted something with a high clarity because then with such a small fossil with orientation, we could easily see it through the resin itself. Once you've made all your decisions, it comes down now to your orientation and grinding. So we recommend once you have your resin block and your sample suspended in the resin that you grind with silica carbide. This uh, helps remove excess resin and helps with the orientation process later on. Uh, we generally go for 800 and 1200 grit because any grits above that can actually really damage your specimen and have some critical failures. So this is a shark tooth, and this is the shark tooth embedded in the resin. The green line represents the plane of observation, and the red line is going to represent our initial cut. So once the specimen is cut, we move on to the silica carbide grinding process. And if we apply equal pressure across the entire specimen, this is great. This is going to help us reach the plane of observation. However, this isn't necessarily how it always works. And sometimes when you make the initial cut, it's offside. But this is easily adjusted with an adjustment of pressure on the same silica carbide plate, still allowing us to reach that plane of observation. We also have to remember that these things are in 3D and sometimes our plane of observation is not quite where we want it to be. So we can actually square up the specimen and add a little bit more resin because that will give us surfaces parallel and perpendicular, allowing easier orientation and cutting in the future. We're now going to talk about contamination and how to avoid it. The easiest way to avoid contamination is to get good at cleaning. You very thoroughly need to clean your samples between each grinding and polishing stage to make sure that contamination doesn't travel through. As you can see here between the lower image and the top image, contamination can very easily move through the grits if not cleaned properly. This is also seen in the polishing stage where critical failures can occur. Nobody wants to be in the situation where they have a nice slide and they're starting to polish it. And then five minutes later, a really big scratch occurs across the surface. So now we move on to polishing the samples. So we use a polishing machine to polish our samples, but this will also work with anybody who's working by hand. We use a diamond grit of six, three and one micron working our way down finer and finer to polish our samples. This is followed by a non-drying colloidal silica suspension, which gives us that final polish after one micron. So now I'm just going to quickly address the most common issues seen while polishing samples. So these are the most common surface features that we see while polishing samples themselves. The first is small frequent scratches that are seen on the surface, as you can see here. These are generally quite fine. They're just, if you're, especially if you're on the six or three micron stage, you can easily see these under a microscope. It's just the diamonds doing their job. Frequent medium sized scratches are a little bit more concerning, but if they are of the same size as your diamond grit, you don't worry. If they're bigger, then you need to look and clean up your workspace because in most cases, this is actually contamination from somewhere has gotten into your diamond grit. If you see infrequent large scratches, this is definitely a sign of contamination and you need to clean everything again before you can continue the polish. High relief and broken edges is just caused by the difference in hardness between your resin and your sample. If you see that this is occurring, you can actually apply just a little bit more pressure and this should allow both the resin and the sample to be polished away at the same speed. 
the orange peel set texture is a high topography texture and this is caused either by over polishing or too much pressure so if you see this you just pull that back a little bit make it a little bit lighter and it should be removed the next is comet trails and luckily i don't have a photo of this but comet trails are where contamination embedded in your resin becomes loose from the grinding stage and moves across your sample and scratches it and this is just a summary of everything that I had just said of all of the missed shots when we we're trying to get the ball into the trash can. So this is kind of the final, just to show that there are some successful stories and it's not all doom and gloom and broken fossils. So here are some of our examples. A is the growth layers within a comedon. B is some dentine tubules within a scale. C is Durango apatite, which is a abiotic crystal. D is dentine within a spinosaur tooth. E are the growth layers within a barnacle. And F is a little bit of uh, maybe some crystals within a different barnacle. So now just to briefly finish, it, I'm going to show you why would we actually care about having a nice surface. So this is the guy, the conodont that we were looking at earlier. And because of the high resolution of the growth layers, we were actually able to track its ontogeny to true time, but also look at its wear and repair patterns in the subsurface to look at its feeding dynamics. And for chemical characterization, this is EDX data from a Durango crystal, which is meant to be homogenous. And you can see that the blue box spots are showing um, on a polished surface, while the orange box spots are on natural voids within the sample itself. And you can see that there's a much larger spread in the predicted element composition within unpolished surfaces versus polished surfaces. So that is my talk. Thank you everybody for listening. And if you have any questions or you want to contact me about this, here's some of my social media and my email address. And enjoy the rest of the conference.